Open your Bible to Jonah chapter 1, please. Jonah chapter 1. I will say from the outset, this is not any normal Jonah sermon, Sunday school lesson, vacation Bible school book uh, message tonight, especially with the time that I've been given, which for the first time, Brother Cook didn't give me any, praise God. I don't wear a watch and I can't see the clock, so we're going to be all right. And I know that uh, Pastor Shybuck will do the heavy lifting tonight. And so I'm going to run us out, set the grass on fire, and let him come and work with uh, everything that's there uh, tonight. But Jonah chapter 1, please let's stand tonight. Jonah chapter 1. And verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship. And he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God. If so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said every one to his fellow, Come. And let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thine occupation? And whence comest thou? What is thy country? And of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am an Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for tonight. Lord, I thank you for this story that you've placed in your word. Lord, I thank you that we can trust the word of God. I thank you that we don't have to apologize for it. We don't have to retranslate it. We can read it, we can preach it, and we can teach it. Lord, I thank you for these men who have come, some a long distance. Lord, it is indeed a humbling thing to stand before others who have been called of God to handle the Word of God and to preach the truths of the Word of God. Lord, I ask you would use me in this time that we have, that you put the world outside these four walls for a time. Bless Pastor Scheibach as he comes in just a few moments. Lord, I ask that you would use his message in a powerful, un, uh, unforgettable way tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and be seated. Catches our attention the very beginning of the book of Jonah, chapter 1, verse 1, when he says, The word of the Lord came unto Jonah. If there was ever a time in our nation that we would hear from the Lord, it would be today. If there was ever a time when the pulpits of America would hear something from God, it would be today. If we had men indeed filling pulpits around our nation that were indeed filled with the Spirit of God, preaching the Word of God with the power of God. Now, it would be impossible to teach and preach this entire book, of course, tonight. But we will look closely at Jonah, the preacher, uh, most of you, if I have been in your pulpit, most of the messages are usually we are expository. We can't exactly do that tonight. I'm a little schizophrenic in conferences. We go a little different direction for the time allowed. But in verse 2, we'll notice, you know the story. He told him, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, 
and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. You'll notice the command given to Jonah to cry against it in the context to preach or to prophesy in a hostile manner. Don't forget, if you're a college student here today, he's telling him, I want you to go and preach in a hostile manner. There is a war about to go on for the souls of men. And listen, when we show up with the gospel, this is not a sharing squeezy time. This is strive, train in at the straight gate to do battle with an adversary. We are trying to loose souls from hell. And he told Jonah, go and cry against the city for their wickedness. You're also going to notice in verse 2 that he uses the word wickedness. God does not command Jonah to go to Nineveh, which was bound for destruction and deserved no mercy, and preach against social injustices. He wasn't sent to do that. He didn't say, go there, there's a lot of bad things going on. It's very violent, uh, preach against that. Jonah was not commanded to preach a message of love wins. He wasn't commanded to do that at all. Or about a life of humans flourishing or Christian hedonism. Understand, these are buzzwords taken by progressives or liberals or those that preach a false gospel. And if you want to argue with me, argue on Wednesday. I fly out tomorrow. Jonah, talk to Brother Cook, Jonah was not calling them out to an emerging faith of a community of believers. I'll say it again. Jonah was not calling them out to an emerging faith of a community of believers. He was sent to cry against their wickedness. Now you know the story. The Bible says that God called him and told him to go. Although Jonah had his calling from God, Jonah did not deem that preaching the truth to these heathen was a good career choice, at least at that time. Now, listen tonight. Do not, especially you younger men, do not mix up the calling of God with your self-style career choices. If any of your dreams for success in the ministry hinder or stifle the calling of God, then you are in danger. If he called you to preach the gospel, or he called you to preach the gospel and then pastor a church, just because you have gifts or abilities or talents or a good skill set does not mean that you are to use that to some career for that ministry if it affects the preaching of the gospel for the calling that God has given you. Now I'll say it again. Just because you've been given abilities in leadership or teaching or marketing or music or writing or any area, there's no license to compromise the gospel or compromise your calling so that you may build a successful ministry career. Take that to heart, young man. The Bible says in uh, verse, uh, verses 3, But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof, verse 4. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. By the way, God is still in charge of the hurricanes. Please stop telling your people that the devil's trying to kill people with hurricanes. God, the last time I checked, when he says, peace be still, it's peace be still. God is still in charge of the weather on this planet. God has not lost any authority that he chooses to own up to. But... Bible says in verse 5, Then the mariners were afraid, and cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God. If so, be that God will think upon us that we perish not. Look at verse 8. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thine occupation? And whence comest thou? What is thy country? And of what people art thou? He's been brought up as a hostile witness. Understand, he didn't even want to go to Nineveh, much less witness to these men on the ship. But God calls him into court right here. He's a hostile witness. He has to answer the questions. And I'll tell you, his answer is pretty good. He said, I am an Hebrew, and I fear the Lord God of heaven, which made the sea and the dry land. Amen. 
Jonah was brought out as a hostile witness. Now listen, old Jonah, in our story here, he's not very impressive. He's got bedhead. He's got that stuff in his eyes. He's got the pajamas with the feet. The yogi bear feet on. And they're bringing him out of bed. And he's dry mouthed from sleeping. He wasn't a very impressive messenger. But he did have the right message. Now you look here, Jonah in verse 10, the Bible says, Then were the men exceedingly afraid. And they said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then said they unto him, what shall we do unto thee that the sea may be calm unto us for the sea wrought and was tempestuous. And he said unto them, take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you for I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Now you would think they've narrowed this thing down He's obviously still the man of God. He has told them what to do. Look at the very next verse. Nevertheless. Nevertheless. Now I will say this. Those men had a higher regard for life than Jonah did. At this moment they're still pagan. They're still heathen. It's a sad thing when lost people have a better understanding of how things are supposed to operate than independent fundamental Baptist people. That's a sad thing. They knew better. But they said, nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to land. You know what this means? We have hurricane-like conditions, and they're rowing on. Now, some of you church members here tonight, when you get preaching and teaching, and it's directed at your problems or your sins, or you come for counseling, and we give you the answer, and you're out there in the storm, and you say, no, I think I'll just keep rowing. I'll just keep going. No, here's the answer to your problems. No, I'm going to just keep rowing. You're going to have to stop rowing. And some preachers we have, before we counsel almost all oh, every week or two or so, I'm counseling with somebody, the Lord's allowed me to help as much as I can. And if I can, I get the answers from him. And then he gives me the answers. And I give them the answers that I don't have. And they want help. And we give them the help they need. We provide the help. And they just keep on rowing. Just let the ship sink. That's just free. That's not in here. But I thought you want to hear that. The Bible says... In verse 14, wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, we beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee. This sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Wouldn't it be great if a guy at the door said, we beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee. You know what Judas didn't do when he repented? He didn't say, I beseech thee. I beseech thee. Why? Because rebellious, stubborn heart. I don't see that here. We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life. And lay not upon us innocent blood. For thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea. And the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. And offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. You know what we see here? We see that the message was more powerful than the messenger. Jonah was nothing impressive. Jonah was asleep. Jonah was running from God. But the message was right. And God used that message in the lives of these men. We hear all the time. I wish God would raise up some great men like in the past. I wish God would have men of this generation like men of the last generation. Can I tell you something tonight? The message hasn't changed. It's the same message. Stop looking for someone that doesn't exist. Look to yourself and the message and the calling that God has given you. God gave you a calling. He'll equip you for the calling. And he's already given you the message. Don't confuse career results with your calling. We've equated bigger budgets, bigger buildings, bigger benches with success. That's the only way we know to measure success in the last 30 or 40 years. I want to ask you a question tonight. 
If you're not mad at all, hopefully this will help. What false prophet, what false prophet, pragmatic humanist, taught you that something small was not successful? Who taught you that? Who taught you that because your ministry wasn't measuring up to someone else's ministry that you were not successful? Well, they, well I'm going to talk about these small churches. What does that mean, small churches? What churches are you in? I know churches. All, I'm, I was in Trona. That town was about to die. And two things happened. God brought in new law. And God brought in a new preacher. Yeah. Bless God, they must have built that thousand cell auditorium by now. Why? It's successful. Amen. They preach the gospel. Like There's transformed lives there. Amen. There's saved people there. The town's back on the map. People are moving back to Trona. Amen. Oh, but they're, but they're what? Small? Compared to what? Go, to, go with us to Norwalk. All Catholic almost now. Basically inner city now. You can't, you can't find a day when they're not doing something over there, Brother Graves, it's your church. It's the men's this. It's the young boys that. It's the teaching time. It's the evangelism time. It's the special meeting time. Yeah, but they're what? They're, oh, they're small. Who told you that's not successful? Afterwards, write his name on a piece of paper and give it to me. Because he's a pragmatic humanist. And if he firmly believes that, he doesn't believe, shouldn't be in the church building business. Apparently, there were several mariners in the story. Aren't their lives important too? What about these guys? We're just worried about Nineveh. We don't have time for these guys. We have to build a big church. Big ministry. Don't the mariners... What if the mariners had wives? What if they had children? What if they had extended family? We, not, we, let, we let people with lesser skill sets handle the little people. Let's, let's send someone who's not as capable to handle those poor people. Why, why are we picking and choosing who goes to hell? And you are so excited because you're not a Calvinist. But you have conditions on who gets the gospel. Based on their financial situation, based on their language history, their heritage, their point of birth. Jonah was certainly not very impressive, but the message was. So God prepared a great fish. That means God knew ahead of time because he prepared the great fish. Isn't it great how God just knows everything? I'm in independent Baptist churches where basically I'm hearing, for you theologicals, an open theism that God has pre-planned the spinning of the top and then God backs up and watches the top spin. That's heresy. God's still in charge. His finger is right here. You ever heard his sermon on God's interventions? I, pre I still preach that. God intervenes. In fact, I brought everything I preach, I think I got from you. I'm glad when he, it's, it's really, as a side here, when he changes his mind on something, it takes me 20 years to find out. So I'm preaching wrong and I find out 20 years later. That's a bummer. Back to the message. So God prepared a great fish and down Jonah goes. I wish somebody would make a good movie because this has to look great. It reminds me of those big catfish that come out and eat birds. I mean, that is something. Now, lest you think Jonah a little too high on his abilities or his education or his alumni or his gifts or his abilities or his methodology, understand in a few moments he's going to come out of the belly of a fish. Of the whale. Don't think too highly of Jonah. We're going to find out. Because when Jonah goes down into the deep. For three days. And he's realizing what's going on. And what God is doing. 
This is exactly the segue that God uses because the last words out of Jonah's mouth before God puts him on the shore facing Nineveh is salvation is of the Lord. It wasn't your education, Jonah. It wasn't your great methodology. It wasn't your intelligence. It wasn't what you thought was good. Look, I know you had all these how to start New Testament church manuals in your backpack. They're all waterlogged. Throw them away and trust me and the message that I've given thee. The gospel is the power of God. The gospel is not just about being connected with people. That's not the gospel. The gospel is not just recognizing beauty in the plant. That's not the gospel. The gospel is not just appreciating diversity in our world. The New Agers do a good job with that. So do the special interest group, by the way. No. Men are born sons of Adam. The, don't tell them something different. Don't make them think that when God made them, listen, God made you because he has all these wonderful, great ideas. Tell that to the folks drowning around the ark. Tell those that were on the airplane about to crash in 9-11. No, God's got a plan. Yeah, we're going to crash in five minutes. No. Children born of the sons of Adam, the Bible says, are born estranged from the womb. The Bible says we're born an enemy of God, a child of the devil. Man is born in darkness with the wrath of God abiding on him. Listen, when you change your song, like a man did recently and told me, we don't sing for such a worm as I anymore because it takes away the potential of man. What potential? You were lost and on your way to hell. You had no potential at that time. Man is dead in trespasses and sins. Man is in bondage and is headed for an eternal hell where love does not win. And you don't get out, by the way. Let's see once again the power of the message. Look at chapter 3 and verse 1. You're supposed to already know this story, so we're not telling everything. By the way, if you're a young person in here... Under the sound of my voice, everything in this book is true. Amen. Everything about the story of Jonah is true, Amen. just like it says it. Yes, any sir. Bible story book, any documentary, any Sunday school teacher tells you different, they are a liar. Amen. This is the truth. Amen. Chapter 3 and verse 1. The Bible says, and the word of the Lord, let's try it again, came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Amen. It's very important. That I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh. According to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now you'll notice that he makes no mention of the journey. He makes no mention of the fish either. Now, I like the chick track with the Jonah guy. It looks pretty neat, him showing up all messed up. But the Bible doesn't say anything about that. He probably wasn't much to look at, though. But God didn't want him going in there telling Jonah's story. He came in to tell God's message. It's not about you, Jonah, and what you've come through. It's going to be the message that I bid thee when you go into Nineveh. He was to preach the message from the Lord. The New Testament tells us that they repented at the preaching of Jonah. But lest you elevate the messenger too high and make him a Baptist pope, the Bible says in verse 5, they believe God. Listen, when it's all said and done, folks, they need to believe God. I know the area you are in. It's difficult. And you want them to trust you. I mean, you have to trust you. But when it's all over, I already know your heart. You want them to believe God. You want them to believe God's word. I don't want the community running around with my name on their lips. We want them running around with the name of Christ. Well, let me introduce you to who? Jesus? Please, use his name before you use my name. 
They were not concerned with apologetics anymore. It was all presuppositional. We're going to fry. We believe it. You'll get that some of you like tomorrow. Verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast. That's good for us. And put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth and satin ashes. Now, if I made a Jonah movie, I would have Jonah all messed up looking, coming into the throne room, pushing open the doors and saying, repent. But it doesn't say that. Because it wasn't about Jonah. Because salvation was of the Lord. And so it said the word came to him. Somebody on the street, some messenger came in and said, listen, a prophet of the living God has come. And you've got to wait till you hear what he said. The word of the Lord came unto the king of Nineveh. And he arose from his throne. He laid his robe from him, covered him with sackcloth, and he sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, Taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? You might say... What does this have to do with anything? You want politics to change? Preach the gospel. I said last year when I was here, how does Barack Obama get in the office when we had so-called millions of people converted in the 60s and 70s? Preach the gospel. Preach the true gospel. You want to fix Washington? Preach the gospel. You want to fix this state that needs fixing? Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel straight so a young man can repent and believe the gospel so he can grow up one day and if God doesn't call him to preach, he can be president someday. But you have to get the gospel first to get him there. He said it affected everybody. You want to change the culture? You want to change where you live? Preach the gospel. Now, Brother Abbott, that's the way they always talk. You should know that my dispensational training does not allow me to find a gospel of grace in the Old Testament. I thought of you. <laughs> but you know what happens if we take this story, throw it in the book of Acts? You know what Jonah would be saying then? Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. That's what he'd be saying. Yeah, brother, but you don't know that. Okay, let me tell you what I do know. Jonah did not send in a survey team to ascertain the heartbeat of the culture. He did not send in some type of a questionnaire. He did not send in a team of, of experts to go out and find what the heartfelt needs were of the community. I can tell you their needs. They're dead in trespasses and sins. That's their need. They are in need of a resurrection. That's their need. Jonah did not develop a message to heal their hurt. I can fix them. And apparently they needed anger management from what we're hearing about the violence. But he didn't start those all over town. No. Jonah did not teach life principles to pagan people in hopes of absorbing them into his community of journey takers. That sounded really good. Journey takers. Come with us. What about our sin? Just come with us. What about repentance? Just come with us. Just keep learning. Just keep hearing. Just keep listening and bring your filth with you. The Roman Catholic Church did really good with making church inviting to the pagans. It was very comfortable. May I come in here? Yeah, got any idols on you? Yeah, they kind of look like ours. Yeah, just come in. That's fine. It was very easy for pagans in the first couple centuries. Because they just kind of let them keep what they had. They didn't have, don't change much. Just stop eating each other. But just come on in. It was very inviting. Jonah did not start a church 
that was Ninevite friendly. How can we make the Ninevites happy? What can we do to relate to Ninevites? Well, you could have like, you know, Battle Royal Friday when they can kill each other. Non-tithers only. Jonah's message was not meant to be inviting or comfortable to the lost hell-bound heathen. I've stayed in some of your homes or I've stayed in homes of your church members. It's always comfortable for me. But just about 99.9% .9 of the time when someone has a home or an apartment or a trailer or a mobile home, they create a place for themselves to be comfortable. I wouldn't go over your house and you say, yeah, our house, Brother Abbott, is just like you like it. We could care less if it's true, right, biblical, or heathen. We just want your house happy for you. Jonah did not try to create an environment so Ninevites could be comfortable in the work. You understand? We don't build churches so that lost people, all they have are lost senses. Do you understand that they're flesh? All they have are lost senses, touch and taste and, and sight and everything in their hearing. So we cannot create an environment that appeals to the only thing they have, flesh. Brother Graves said it so well Saturday. We've made it a spectator sport because we've given them something to stare at and look at like it's some kind of a show. John the Baptist said, what did you come here for? Who warned you to flee the wrath to come? They came thinking they were looking at a spectacle. And they found out they found a man of God. Amen. Jonah did not go to fix broken marriages. I've got my manual somewhere. You guys hold on. Stop fighting. <laughs> Jonah did not go to stop substance abuse. Well, we can fix that. We can fix it. No, you can't fix anything. I know sometimes people quit things on their own. I understand that. But not without the gospel. Amen. Not without the gospel. Jonah did not go to end violence and promise peace. Jonah did not go to teach financial principles or child rearing or marriage principles as a way to attract the crowd. Right. Seventh-day Adventist done a good job in some of your towns. How to quit smoking years ago. The quit smoking club. Everybody came. Quit drinking club. Everybody came. Then they got on the losing weight club and nobody came. What'd they do? They had a draw card. That's not the gospel. And they certainly didn't have it. Jonah was not interested in playing popular Ninevite music. What do the Ninevites listen to? Well, let's put that on. Well, brother, we're not guilty of that. He didn't even create music that sounded or resembled Ninevite music. And he didn't get Ninevite, the Ninevite Christian music that didn't exist. And translate that music into Jonah Christian music. Do you understand? Stay away from the Ninevites. We don't have to absorb or use their culture. We're not trying to be relevant with anybody. The Bible says it's the foolishness of preaching. Jonah did not adopt verbiage or trendy Ninevite words or terms. We're getting good at this. This is getting interesting. I've noticed this is really happening. You know, it is getting quieter. I can hear myself better. And, and there's many circles and not just, just with ourselves. They're using words like, we have an organic ministry. Now, I looked this up. I look, Googled it myself. I don't have assistants like you that do all the work. Organic means derived from living matter. This is not Trader Joe's. This is church. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, there's also what they call organic growth in business. I looked this up. The process of business expansion by increased output. Not by acquiring or adding some other group to you. Listen, I don't know what this means. The closest thing to organic you have in your churches is people having babies. You want organic growth? Have a bunch of kids. 
That's the only possible organic growth that is possible. That people are, by the way, Christians should be having children. Amen. Amen. I have nine. Together, we have a good time. We get together. Man, the food, that'd be some good food. That's the only thing I can find is organic, trendy, popular, relative. Hey, listen, Mr. Trader Joe. The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. I didn't hear anything about organic. So then I'm reading this article, a magazine. I never read magazines. Who buys magazines? I read in a magazine. So we have a holistic ministry. Essential oils? I was look. I had to look this up. Now, I'll be honest, I found strange definitions for holistic. I did. This word has philosophical connotations. It has metaphysical connotations. It has medical definitions. So I think I know what they're trying to say. So let's, let's, let's forget about what they're trying to say and use the Bible. The Bible says that we are quickened, made alive together with Jesus Christ. We are transformed into the image of Christ. We are to go and evangelize and add to the church. I can live with that. I don't need holistic. Now here's one. You said about throwing stones. They're not supposed to throw them to me. Now, this is very popular now, and we have to be very careful because no one, listen, if no one agrees on a popular definition, you must be careful using it. And the word, and you've heard the word, it's missional. No one agrees on what missional means. They have all kinds of ideas of what missional means. But Brother Abbott, you just don't understand. Listen, when you use terms, think about this. Why don't I use a Bible term instead? Why is it so hard for me to use Bible words? and Bible phraseology. Amen. Well, you don't understand. No, I do understand. That's why I'm here. Brother Abby, you just don't understand that culture and worldview and generations change. No, but see, the Word of God does not change. And the preaching of the cross does not change. And the sinful nature of men does not change. The unregenerate of the first century needed to see themselves not as some person with some potential that they could become in the Roman Empire. No, they need to see themselves as lost and guilty sinners in need of Christ. What would you have told first century people? God's got a wonderful plan for your life. Someday the Romans will be gone and you can have your own country back. That doesn't even make sense. Why don't you tell them this? You need Christ. And you're lost. And you're going to hell. And these things you believe are no good. How about the dark ages? Certainly there's more relevance there. You know, dark ages, they didn't have to be told God will fix your poor and hungriness. They were poor and they were hungry. And if they got saved, guess what happened the next day? They're going to be poor and they're going to be hungry the next day too. Don't offer them being, not being poor and not being hungry. Because you still might be poor and hungry. You go to a third world country and you tell them, God's going to give you a, a bag of oatmeal tomorrow. Don't pro make some prosperity promise. Tell them this. Tell them that the wrath of God is real. And that may, you might not understand this, but the sins that you have committed are real. And in the sight of a holy God, they are heinous and sinful and wicked and awful. And you must trust Christ. Now, they need to hear that all they, although they might die poor and sick, they can turn to the Lord Jesus and be saved from their sin. Well, Brother Abbott, I know the problem. You don't understand the millennials. So you like Sigmund Freud. You like evolutionary, man-made, created terms for creating generational divisiveness. Whoever creates the terms controls the people. Whoever, whoever tells you what you are and who you are will control what you buy and where you live and how you speak and what kind of technology you use and they'll even tell you your view of God. Millennials don't need books or sermons with quirky titles. 
They don't need weeks and months of coddling either. They need the foolishness of preaching. Amen. Brother Habit. That's where a millennial might talk to me. Brother Abbott, <laughs> millennials want answers. You forgot that the natural man received not the things of the Spirit of God. How many answers do you want? All the answers in the world aren't going to save you. All the knowledge in the world is not going to save you. They want answers. It's not about their answers. It's about their sin. Tell the millennial this. They interviewed me at a conference and they said, can you tell us how you would give the millennial the most generation the gospel? I said, sure. Tell them this. Tell them that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Tell him, wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, including the millennials and all have sinned. Tell him that God is angry with the wicked every day, foaming at the mouth mad. Tell him that. Now, if he can live through this, tell him his sin will one day get him flung with force into hell. Tell him that the Lord Jesus Christ is our God and our King. Tell him, Romans 5, 8, that God commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He introduces his love favorably to us. He brings that love to us, showing us our condition. Tell him that if he does not repent from his sin towards Christ, that he will burn forever and there is no winning at the end to get out. Tell him that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, shed his perfect blood, and that blood is the price of the atonement, of his redemption from darkness and from bondage. Tell him that that deliverer, that redeemer, is also his king. He's also his Lord. He's also his God. Fear and tremble before the God of the universe. This is real. It's not an academic exercise. Now, if you're called to preach tonight, you're called to preach the gospel, not just to build your church or your career, but to obey God's command so that men may be redeemed. That's why we do what we do. That's why I tra we travel all over the country. We go to little churches, churches of two people, churches with a lot of people, churches with a little bit of people. It doesn't matter the size of the church. What matters is the message that's being preached to these people. It cannot be watered down. It cannot be afflicted, affected, or infected with modern day verbiage or man-made philosophy. It must be the word of God. Unashamedly, no political correctness to it. No, we come so that we will obey God's command so that men may be redeemed. Jonah's message is just like our message. Jonah's message, repent. Judgment's coming. I don't know what your tracks say. I don't know what your websites say. But if your grandma or your teenager or someone you love with all your heart read your plan of salvation, you think they'd get saved?